Joining us on stage is Bogdan Yerdaki from How To Web. His topic is learning to fly, building tech startups in Southeast Europe. And joining him is my colleague Vuxan, who's going to be the moderator, who works for .me and is personally responsible for like 87% of the laughter that happens in the office. So Vuxan and Bogdan, welcome. Okay. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, now I feel that I need to live up to the expectations and there's pressure, pressure building up. Okay, our next guest is Bogdan Yordaki. He describes himself as tech savvy, entrepreneur, geek, and Star Trek fan. So yes, we have another Star Trek slash Star Wars fan. Uh, Bogdan is a co-founder of Startup Spotlight, co-founder of Tech Launch, co-founder of Tech Angels, co-founder of Tech Hub. So quick note to the audience here, Basically, if you hit it off with Bogdan in Budva, you may as well co-found a startup with him. Without further ado, Bogdan Yordaki in Learning to Fly. Thank you. I get the honor to be the last man standing between uh, now and lunch, <laughs> which means I'll be pretty brief. Um, first of all, Many thanks, Natasha, for inviting me here. Congrats to the Domain Me team. They've put a wonderful show together. Give them a big round of applause. Uh, second, not least, I have a friend in Romania who's asking me, why am I going to this Spank Me conference in Montenegro? So you may, you know, you may, uh, you may work on the branding, uh, but that's a good hook, I would say. Okay, um, when Natasha invited me, to uh, spark me. Um, I, I talked to her a little bit about you know, what would be interesting to, to, to talk about, what would be interesting uh, for me to say. Because um, it's, I mean, it's no fun to talk to f about football to, a, to an astronaut, right? You kind of try to find the middle ground. Uh, so before going on, I want to ask you a little bit about yourself. Um, who is a startup founder or co-founder or like early stage uh, developer employee in a startup. Excellent. How many of you are students? Okay. How many of you work in the, let's say more co the corporate environment? Okay. So I'm really curious what the other third of the room is doing, but yeah. Um, A little bit about me. I've been really busy. Um, I, um, I'm a small time tech entrepreneur. I've started two tech companies. One of them failed miserably. The other one uh, still makes money, which is always a good thing. Um, a few years later, trying to learn more about how to build a tech company, I started a tech conference in, in Romania, which is called How to Web, turned out to be the biggest Southeastern European conference on tech and entrepreneurship. And along with that, we started a wonderful four-day program for early stage startups from the Central, European, um, Central and Eastern European region called Startup Spotlight. Probably we'll talk more about that later. Um, and because of how to web, um, I also well, gave, gave a hand in co-founding a number of local initiatives, um, like the first business angel network in Romania, Tech Hub Bucharest, and many others. Um, and also about, because of how to web, I got involved with numerous acceleration programs, um, which we'll talk about, like Seedcamp, Springboard, now Techstars, uh, Hack Forward, um, Launch Hub, Eleven, and many others. Don't remember them all. So before starting this talk, which I promise it won't be really, really long, um, I wanted to figure out a starting point. So the starting point is about who are we? What's really special with us, you know, people from this room, people from this region? Well, if you talk to people from, you know, US, Western Europe, um, the first thing that comes there in their mind when they talk to Eastern Europeans is that we have great developers, we have great hackers. So that's really an interesting approach and it got me thinking throughout the years, why are we good hackers? Because we are. Um, I think this is the blessed, the, the, the biggest, um, the best addition that we got from the communist era. In the communist era, I don't know if you know, but 
arts were not really appreciated, uh, engineering was way more interesting because you can put a lot of numbers on that. Um, people were learning mathematics and physics and being an engineer was one of the best career paths possible. So that's really interesting because in the same time at home, people were repairing stuff like, I don't know, my parents were repairing TV sets, washing machines, even their own car. Like everybody in Romania back in the days had a Dacia car that they were able to repair on side of the road. Doesn't matter what was happening with the car. So this combination of engineering and lack of resources created um, creative engineering culture, a hacker culture in this region of the world, which is really interesting. But there's one more interesting thing about this. Because we are all, we have this hacking culture really embedded in our daily habits, we started, us as uh, tech founders in this region, we started to be more um, knowledgeable about how to sell products to other engineers like us. So if you analyze, you know, the successes that we've got in this region in the last 10, 20 years, you see that we've got a really good number of tech startups that were solving engineering problem, like NetBeans that was acquired by Sun Microsystem. We had Interact in Romania that was acquired by Adobe. Um, right now we have a huge company in Bulgaria called Telerik who is building uh, tools for developers and so many others. I mean, there's a company in Bulgaria that is acquiring uh, startups from Silicon Valley. It's that big. So engineers build good tools for engineers. That's a really, you know, interesting thought. And maybe, I mean, if you are good at this thing, you should do it more often. The second thing that I wanted to tell you about is, well, you know, everybody says, so you're good hackers. If you're good hackers, why don't we be, build here tens of Facebooks, right? We are good hackers. Why don't we have at least 100 Googles? Well, now this is the sad part, so please don't cry, but this is the sad part. The sad part is that we have this disconnection between our geographical space and the target market that we are trying to acquire. If you think about all these successful startups that are trying to you know, build international products, create innovation, uh, finding new ways to solve a problem or uh, finding um, um, a new problem to solve, all of them are targeting a market that is outside Southeastern Europe, right? So that's really interesting because you may wonder, does it worth it? I mean, you're trying to, you know, sell stuff to people from another space, another culture. It might be expensive. You need to, uh, as John was saying, by the way, John, thanks for warming up the atmosphere for me. So as John was saying earlier, um, you need, you know, a distributor. You need somebody on, in that physical space to sell your stuff. So is it worth it? Well, let's consider the alternatives, right? So if you want to fund a tech company, you can start building a local product company, a company that is building a product for the local market. But the value of the local market is so small, you can't pull off a decent company because you just don't have enough clients. Um, think about the software as a service market. I mean, probably in Montenegro, the software as a service market is somewhere around, I don't know, in the million of dollars, right? If you, if you look at the global market, is in the tens of billions, if not even bigger, hundreds of billions. It's a huge market. Other option, a service-oriented company. I mean, we have this, we have a lot of outsourcing companies around here. Um, even in Romania, we have some big ass, uh, a few hundred people, um, service companies. But building a service company is not that interesting because it's not scalable. If you want to you know, measure the, the, the value that you create through a service-oriented company, try to do this simple mathematics. Um, you get 40 developers and you're trying to multiply that with the numbers of hours that they work in a year and with the price that they pay, that a client will pay for that hour. And a company with 40 developers can't be more valuable than 10 million dollars. It just can't be. It's mathematically impossible.
In the same time, a company with 40 developers, Evernote, reached a 1 billion evaluation by building a killer ass product that was distributed throughout the world. So this is a huge difference when you, build, when you think about building a service company versus a product company. This is the value of innovation. This is the value of intellectual property. So build, building innovative products should be um, your top priority. I mean, maybe you can't reach that from step one, but it definitely should be your top priority when you start thinking about you know, building a company. So what else should you do? Well, I suggest you should start looking for models. This is, I mean, I've been a tech entrepreneur in Romania since 2004. Nowadays, it's so exciting to be part of this region because we see so many companies that are succeeding. We have a fantastically bigger number of companies that are doing amazing stuff in this region. And just like, I won't, uh, I won't uh, tell you too many of them, but just look at this list, I mean, and probably we can put together two or three more names. Nordeus from Serbia, Logmein from um, Hungary, which is listed on, on the stock exchange in US. Uh, Bitdefender, a huge antivirus company from, from Romania. Uh, Prezi from um, Hungary as well. Telerik from uh, Bulgaria. So many others. Amazing companies. But when you start analyzing what these companies have done, you stumble upon a very interesting phenomenon. In the last five years, almost all the companies that have grown out of southeastern Europe are either software as a service companies or gaming companies. Um, we haven't had a properly big um, B2C consumer company except for Prezi in the last years. So why is that? I mean, I don't know. I, I could you know, throw, out, throw in a few ideas. I would say that the MVP cost for building B2C is quite expensive because you know, when you do B2C, you kind of have to understand the target market, the culture. You probably need more iterations, so that costs quite a lot. Then you don't have um, uh, monetization very early on. I mean, if you build software as a service, you can charge the first customer that you get. But if you build B2C, sometimes you have indirect monetization, kind of you know, more tricky. So again, when you think, if, if you have like an incumbent technology that you're thinking of putting in a product, Maybe you should start by evaluating software as a service in gaming first if you are like an early stage um, uh, entrepreneur, if you are just like, maybe it's your first or second venture. Because this too seems to work pretty well. One other very interesting development in the last year is the growing number of resources for learning. Right now, if you're in Montenegro, you can get a way better education than I got when I was a student. Because you have access to so many amazing resources. Like right now, you can go online and you can have proper classes from Stanford, MIT, or Harvard, or I don't know, a bunch of, of other amazing universities in in US and throughout the world. And you know, you can you can reach out to tech outlets like TechCrunch and Pando Daily and uh, the next web so you can connect to that mentality, to, that, to, to, to the global problems that uh, are needed to be solved. And you have tens of blogs. I mean, everybody is blogging right, nowadays, right? You can, you can read Fred Wilson, you can read Chris Dixon, you can read, um, I don't know, Dave McClure, uh, Mark Schuster, so many other amazing bloggers that talk about technology and business. But there's a very important other thing and that is meeting your local community. I mean, you can, you can read a lot of stuff on the web, but you need people to discuss with the things that you talk. So one really important thing is going out, meeting the local community that you have around you. And if you don't have a local community, maybe it's the right time to start it yourself. It can be just a group of five people that are meeting for a coffee. That was you know, open coffee in Bucharest back in 2008. We were five to 10 people having coffee every Friday morning. Now a regular meetup at Tech Hub Bucharest is 100 plus people. And I've seen that there are a few uh, people from the corporate world. 
um, I think building such tech communities could be a good part of your agenda. There's something that you can facilitate because you have access to resources, to money, to logistics, and you can help out the people that want to do this and you know, help the others around them. So, fourth idea, connect to your local community and connect to the global knowledge of the web. Think about the bigger picture while working with the people around you. If you start you know, working on your startup, there are two things um, that you'll see are basically the driving forces um, of what you do, which is money and learning. Somebody may argue that actually there's just one, which is learning, and learning how to make money, learning how to build a product, learning how to put together a team, learning how to finance that, learning how to grow it. Um, but money is more, I don't know, let's say direct. So let's talk about that first. Five years ago, early stage money in Southeastern Europe. Nothing. You had absolutely no opportunity, like real opportunity, to get financing. There was no resource, right? Nowadays, things have changed dramatically. There are tens of accelerators throughout Europe that are eager to find very good entrepreneurs, that are eager to find very good startups. If you don't know what an accelerator is, an accelerator is a training plus investment program that normally lasts for three years, gives away uh, 15 to 50 Ks for 6 to 10% in equity. So that's an excellent way to kickstart um, your business. I mean, we have Dillian from 11, I think, here. Uh, we also have a lot of, a lot of accelerators from, from Europe, from Techstars London to Seedcamp to Rockstar to so many others in Estonia, in Germany, looking for very valuable team. It's totally up to you to get their money. So this is something that I would advise um, all first-time entrepreneurs. If you want to have like a good jump start into building a tech company, think about the accelerators. They can teach you so much in such a short period of time. Last but not least, building a startup is a learning process. I mean, this is the most interesting thing that you can discover while you build your startup, is that while you have this whole agenda of launching new versions, uh, acquiring clients, getting financed, you may put together a new agenda about how it is, wh what are the things that you want to learn and to develop in your company. And one of the most proper things to do if you have a startup, is to meet a lot of people that can give you good advices about that startup. In the accelerator process, uh, we call them mentors, but basically we're talking about you know, experts, entrepreneurs, investors, people who could have a good um, insight on what you're doing and they can help you learn a lot. In, in accelerators, normally you meet around 80 mentors in three months, which is quite a lot. Uh, probably you do that if you have a startup in a year. But anyway, the process is almost the same, except for the fact that in accelerators, you kind of have to rush things. So every time you talk to mentors, you get a, you know, people tell you something that normally should be interesting, but most of the time you kind of have to decrypt that message. And I've seen a lot of mistakes being made by uh, founders of startups during the mentoring process and I want to address a few very common things. So first of all, every time you talk to mentors, think about the fact that mentors are biased. If you have some early stage technology and you talk to a mentor that is really into B2B, he will look at that technology and he will say, you have to do a B2B product with this thing. If you talk to another mentor who is totally into B2C and he looks at the same technology, he sees a B2C product. So the information in itself is valuable, but you have to put a little bit of context around it so you understand it better. Next thing, mentors are not necessarily clients. This is, I mean, sometimes you see a, an entrepreneur almost crying, telling you that, you know, he talked to this guy and that guy said that he will never use his product. Well, that's not really important. I mean, Sometimes mentors do really foolish things and they start acting like clients. If a mentor starts thinking about using the product, then he's a client, he's not a mentor anymore. And if you have like a profile for your client 
and you look at the profile of this mentor, if they match and that guy tells you that you know, he won't use your product, well then you have a problem. But if they don't, if they have different profiles, then maybe it's a confirmation that whatever you are doing is a great, great thing. So think about that. Again, context is really important. Also, put more emphasis on how many of those guys have actually skin in the game. I mean, if you talk to somebody for 20 minutes during a coffee break, you may get some nice information. But if you talk to somebody else who might be interested to invest in your startup, to work with you, to be a distributor, a part partner, then his or her information should be probably prioritized more than you know, somebody who's just famous. So figure out what, not what mentors are saying, but why. Put context around that information. All right, so these were my advices. Uh, I hope you liked it. Hope that was interesting enough for you. Well, one more thing. Um, I think that right now we have the best time in history to start a tech company. You have so many support systems around you that were non-existent five or ten years ago. Absolutely none of them. Right now is the best time to start a tech company. And if you really want to start a tech company, you've got no excuse not to do it. You've got everything that you need. You got knowledge, you got models, you got early stage money, you got mentors, you got any, everything that you need. So start it now. Okay, so before we move further, I would actually like to, let, let's talk a bit about these early beginnings, about yeah. how to web, about the follow through startup spotlight program, how you invited the first speakers, why did you decide to launch the conference? Okay, so uh, let's talk about that. It's, it's, a, it's a really easy, I mean, I get asked, I get asked this quite a lot. Um, so I have uh, a tech company that is doing email marketing. Um, I was really... I was a programmer, so I, was, I wrote the whole software by myself, um, and I had a co-founder who was a, a sysadmin uh, managing, oh, okay. managing, yeah. managing the, the servers. Managing the back end. Yeah, exactly. So um, I started going to events in Romania for learning more about the business side of things. The events were crap. Didn't like any of those. And then I got back to... Um, I got back home one day, started looking on the web for conferences abroad, and by mistake, I ended up at the next web, uh, to, uh, not the next web, Low Web 2008. Um, back then, the uh, Low Web was the biggest tech conference in Europe, uh, 1,700 people, and there were three Romanians, me and two other guys. Uh, it was really amazing. I mean, uh, and it created it such a, a huge impact yeah, on me that when I went back home, I started uh, thinking about building a conference because I thought that that could have more impact than me working on email marketing software. Okay, that's great. So it was sort of a destiny. Three Romanians meet in France, decide to go the, the yeah, yeah. and launch. I, I didn't even start the conference with those guys, with uh, some other guys, oh, okay. but yeah, that okay. was the story. Cool. cool. So uh, basically, what you guys are trying with Start the Spotlight is to sort of bridge the gap be between engineering talent that we have in Southeast yeah. Europe and running successful business. And how does that translate? How does the so tech talent translate to successful business here? Because obviously, there seem to be a lot of barriers, maybe even like barriers in mentality to that. So Startup Spotlight is really, I would say, it's the most successful part of How to Web. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we so appreciate your honesty. I, I mean, How to Web is a 1,000 people event, but uh, I love the impact that Startup Spotlight has, and it's been um, massive. So last year, we had 30 startups coming from all around Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the winners were from Greece, by the way. Okay. Um, and out of 30, 10, got a major deal during Startup Spotlight. Like They got an investment, they were accepted into an accelerator, uh, they got a partnership from uh, 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 an infrastructure company, or they sign a major client, which is a 30% chance, it's not bad. 
Oh, that's great. It's Would you mind like uh, giving a brief description of like three or four alumni of the program? Yeah. So uh, like last year, we had a company uh, that, uh, so the guys that won are a company from, from Greece uh, called Incredible. Um, I talked to the guy three hours after the results were announced. Uh, Mike, was at, Mike Butcher was at the conference. He wrote a blog post on TechCrunch. Okay. Uh, so in three hours, the guys who are doing like an Airbnb for boats, um, oh. they got uh, two offers from VC companies. Uh, three people who had uh, boats uh, called them, like a number of boats each. And they had over 100 registrations on their platform, which again is for boats, which is not for everybody, right? Um, so that was totally a good outcome for them. Um, then we have another company, which is kind of a, a company that it's been around with HowToWeb for years. Um, a team, the team behind Mavenhut, Mavenhut does casual games. Um, they started talking about building the company at HowToWeb in 2010. They went to an accelerator after How to Web 2011 because they met uh, the, the co-founder of that accelerator at How to Web, and he invited them over there. They went to Startup Bootcamp Dublin. And in 2012, they won the best pitch uh, at the event, and they, got, uh, they announced a half a million investment round uh, during How to Web, uh, a gaming company which is one year and a half old with, I think, uh, uh, over a million monthly active users, which is quite good in the gaming world. That's great. That's um, great. Yeah, another company, Game Million, which is like a software as a service thing for building games, they got accepted into um, Eleven. They got accepted to uh, Mozilla Web Forward in, in Silicon Valley, uh, and they signed a deal with I think it was uh, Softlayer for infrastructure services. All of that after How to Web 2012. Cool. That's nice. Uh, Basically, one thing that comes to my mind whenever I talk to an entrepreneur or, or a tech savvy uh, is when it comes to launching a startup, actually when it comes to running a startup, how do you gain that initial traction? How, that's, I mean, that, it feels that that's the most difficult thing to do. Is there any method, blaze, trail, or anything you can re rely on, anything you can recommend to, to get more and more people? So I think it really depends on to each. To use your service. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on you know on, each, what you on on what type of company do you have. Um, you you have kind of a, a number of methods. I can tell you that my I have a few friends in in Romania who had this problem. They had a um, job listing websites, right? So in a job listing websites, the problem that you have is that if you don't have jobs, you don't have visitors. If you don't have visitors, you don't have jobs. Chicken and egg problem. Exactly. How do so you... what they did back then was um, every morning they were buying all the newspapers in, in, uh, in Romania, the, the major ones, and they were manually introducing all the jobs uh, where you had an email address into the system. So okay. you kind of solve one side of the problem and they started to gain traction and it turned out to be a successful business. Oh, so basically we need to start being innovative even when it comes yeah. to that part. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. So what is, I mean, you mentioned the startup that disrupted the boat renting industry. What, is, what are the other industries that you think could be disrupted or that you would like to see being disrupted? Uh, so I think there's a... Uh, Where is the potential? I, I see, well, you have, right, you have two big industries that people are looking at them right now, which is the financial industry and the education industry, which are pretty hot. You see a lot of accelerators uh, um, specialized into this, even investment funds specialized into this type of um, startups. So that's, uh, um, those are two in interesting industries. But also you see the enterprise industry okay. uh, being disrupted as we speak. Uh, you see a lot of vertical services um, building up in that, in that space, like, I don't know, uh, Box and so many others. Was one of them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, when you compare, let's try to compare, like, uh, the Balkans and the rest of the countries in Southeast Europe. Can you compare them in terms of innovation and where is the Balkans right now? What would you say? I mean, so in in um, in Eastern Europe, you have three special cases. Uh, that is Poland, Russia, 
and um, Turkey. Okay. Right? Every, all of them are really interesting because they have big local markets. They have markets which are big enough to build um, successful companies in that market. The rest of the countries don't have. So you see a little bit of difference here because you may have a bigger number of startups going international from companies like, from countries like, I don't know, uh, uh, Romania because, or more vocal at least, because uh, the ones from, from these three countries can build a lot of things inside. And think about the fact that right now, you know, the most valuable European company is a Russian company, right? It's mail.ru, it's oh, yeah, a yeah. huge company. It is a huge company. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, there's Yandex as well. Also. Yeah, that's true. search engine. Yeah. Another one. Yep, true. Uh, basically, what else do we have here? Um, can I, can I add one more thing? Oh, yeah, and then sure. we can take sure. questions if that's the case or you just want to you know, rush out to, to get food, um, which I totally understand because yeah. I'm starving myself. So um, I wanted to, this is something that I w wanted to, to, to tell to all of you. If you have startups, if you are interested you know, to um, get to know some early stage investors or mentors or just people who can help you out, check out startupspotlight.co. Um, it's an amazing four-day program where you meet tens of mentors, uh, you meet uh, tens of early stage investors. We, invest, we uh, invite um, excellent acceleration programs from throughout the world, uh, early stage investment funds, business angels from the region, only the ones that are really business angels and not just write on their badge, business angel, but people with proven track record in investment. Um, and we put together this wonderful program with pitching during the conference, uh, mentoring sessions, one-to-one -one meetings with experts, and we give away $20,000 in cash awards for four lucky winners. So check it out, please. Oh, actually, I have one more. Sir, you told people what startups should do. Uh, can we like turn that around? What you shouldn't do? <laughs> oh, there's so many things. Um, I think like the, the, the most... So, Two or three things. First of all, having a startup means being agile. Um, Steve Blank is saying that the difference between a startup and a company is that a startup is looking for a business model, and when it finds that business model, it starts repeating, uh, executing that business model to make money. If you're in the startup world, you are searching for something and you don't know exactly what. Uh, you have to be flexible. You don't have to you know, have this a fantastic plan when you start, you have to be flexible and learn and understand how can you um, uh, build a business out of that. Uh, second thing uh, that I would say is that if you have a startup, if you think about a startup, don't think of doing it because you'll make more money. Um, normally you won't. The failure rate for startups is really, really high. And there are a few lucky winners that almost take, you know, all the prize. Um, start off doing something that matches your skills and your passions. So even if you fail, doing that startup and learning more in that field will actually be a huge benefit for you, no matter what the, the, the money side. Um, and also, don't try to do, try to do decent mistakes. So it's okay to fail, but please don't break your head when you fail a startup. Did you uh, say in the just, States? Sorry? In the States? Is that try to go and like win in the States or, or, or adjustments? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I think, I think that we, we've seen a few startups that have made good, decent money in Europe. Okay. Um, but yes, eventually everybody wants to go to the States because that's the biggest market that's ever. True. Okay. Do we have any questions for Bogdan? Bogdan will invest in your startup if you have any questions. <laughs> Ten bucks. No questions? Okay, we have one here. Ivo will ask me what I want to okay. eat at lunch. <laughs> and it's a tough one, I can see the look at so, his face. Um, so, uh, Ivo Spiegel from Zagreb Zip. So, if the states are the biggest market, 
Uh, wouldn't you say that Russia and China and Asia are just as big or even bigger for some areas and sec sectors, segments? Um, definitely huge markets. There is this problem with a cultural fit. Uh, I, we haven't seen companies that have built, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of companies that have scaled uh, in Russia uh, immensely coming out of Romania. Um, Romania is, well, Romania is quite atypical because it's an orthodox Latin country. We kind of, we don't fit in, in this space really well. Um, China is also a big market, but I, I don't know. I think there is, there are more steps to be done towards acquiring this cultural fit for building tech companies in that space coming out from Eastern Europe. Uh, I think we are kind of used to look to the West. And that's why we go to Western Europe and to the States. Yeah. We used to. Uh, maybe somebody will change that. It's the same with you know, software as a service and gaming. So the numbers say that those are the easiest companies to build right now if you start from here. But that doesn't matter that tomorrow we can't have a fantastic mobile company uh, showing up. One more. I'm not starving, so, but I'll try to be short. I have two remarks on your uh, Please. Uh, presentation in the, all in the morning. First of all, about China and the East, our mind is stuck in the past. Like 30, 40 years ago, we had nothing there. Later, we saw that this is the largest market. Now, they have in China development and research and everything not just in China, all over. And you must think that in 10, 20 years from now, maybe they'll control also the money. So looking at, to the West is not yeah. too smart today, but you need to see the future. Second, I want to, <coughs> to add a, a philosophical remark. We, we heard about sort of procedures and processes to succeed. I must uh, add that this all are just necessary, but not sufficient, because it's like a catch-22 situation. I, I have seen it all in my life. So if we could have or would have processes, and the world is really competitive, so what's the big deal? If everyone can do it, it's not enough. You need more ingredients. And this is the, what should be sufficient. And a uh, uh, last remind, uh, remark that I know perfectly from my career, uh, an entrepreneur or slash founder should be a warrior. Because if you have a real good ideas, and the sometimes badger. breakthrough ideas, all those that spoke here, and including myself, they Many times they do not know nothing about the real future. And you should fight your investors, your uh, mentors sometimes, and you should try to find your way. And you should avoid the, the regular mistakes, but you should be a warrior. Otherwise, you are not a startupist. And a startup, I agree, is not a company. Yeah. You a should be the honey badger. That's, it's, that's it's the a thing. different arena. So, since you are all starving. Uh, we have more for one more question. We have time for one more question. No more questions? Okay, let's wrap it up then. We'll be back here in an hour. Buon appetit, everybody. Thank you.